So uh, we're now with that approaching the last segment of this part of the conference. Uh, this is a kind of a, the rest of the afternoon essentially synthesis work, uh, trying really to bring together the insights from day one, where we had um, uh, a broader discussion about conceptual issues and perspectives on OER with uh, empirical uh, and the case studies from day two and this morning, also the wonderful and really powerful narratives. Uh, and a first start for this kind of synthesis work will happen in this room. So we'll start with the plenary. Uh, Kathy Casserly is already here and uh, we'll do the magic, I hope, uh, to bring it all together or closer together. That's uh, fantastic. Um, and uh, I think the template that uh, the Hewlett team presented on, on day one, uh, the pillar model, uh, that's kind of a helpful framing and, and in my view we could try uh, to uh, feed back our inputs into uh, that uh, model that we got presented. Um, but without further ado, over to you. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you know, let me try this so I can see more. What's behind me is also in front of me. All right, so um, it's been, I think, an amazing uh, day and a half that we've been here. Where it's not over, but what I want to do is give you a frame to think about the OER ecosystem. It's not complete. It's the beginning. Some of it's obvious. Some of it's not obvious to the fundamentalists, particularly, that Jonathan just spoke about. Um, and then what I want to do is make sure we have 15 minutes at the end to add to it, so we can add the additional elements of the frame. So this should be 15 minutes. I know my timer is here somewhere. He's right here. He's keeping a good watch on me. And uh, we will keep it moving. So let me get used to this clicker. So the OER infrastructure. These are the questions I was asked to, to focus on. What are the required elements? All right, so as we think about the infrastructure, it's complicated. Infrastructure lies underneath everything else. It's kind of the plumbing that makes buildings work, but it's invisible. So how do we build it for OER? What's critical? <coughs> the first required element is to teach people. This may, see, may seem simple, particularly to the group here in this room, but there are many of us, many who do not know about OER. And they do not know what it is, and you can't adopt what you don't know. You have to begin to understand. You have to understand copyright. You have to understand where and when it could apply. This is all because the age of the internet, Jonathan spoke about it, we all know about it. We know about the age of people coming together with the computer, with the distribution of the net. We now have affordances we never had previously. We need to talk about these affordances. We need to let the world know. We need to let educators and policymakers know. And those begin with conversations. So how do we do that in a very effective and efficient way? <coughs> Required element number two, how do we think about what the open definition is? If I were to ask each person in this room, would you all give me the same definition of open? And then do we go out to the broader community and talk about what that definition is? So what is the open definition? I would say the definition is free, no cost access. And as I was putting this deck together, I really think I'd like to just kind of eliminate free. And perhaps we should just use the word no cost because there's a connotation that's been carried forward from the very beginning with the word free, that free actually doesn't mean high quality. So that may be something that we want to talk about. Is that something that we just may want to think about? And the second is we have to make sure there's legal rights to reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. That goes to Hal's point yesterday. It goes to the point about the recycle, right? It goes to the point of using data to improve. The vision has always been about optimizing access to these high quality materials, but it's really about the rapid improvement cycles, which we haven't really hit on yet, that will make all the difference. Required element number three, how do we think about open repositories and refractories? We need to have quite a few of these. They need to exist. They need to be out there. These are just the bunnies exemplaring the <laughs> OER repositories. We need high quality repositories. They have to have strong content. A lot of this and much of this exists. How do we continue to evolve it as we go forward? Number four, machine readable metadata. How do we find search and discovery continues to be an issue and a challenge? How do we think about it? CC licenses are expressed in three ways. This is part of the uniqueness of the space. 
Number five, how do we think about open policies for governments and foundations? We have a number of leadership organizations who have stepped in. We need many more. This is where the power of the money and the power of policy comes into play. ULIT obviously has been an early leader. The Gates Foundation has stepped in. This is just some of them. Shuttleworth Foundation, 20 Million Minds, Department of Education, Department of Labor, Utah State. At all different levels, national, <laughs> departments, and ministry, departments and ministries, federal, state in this, in this country, we have to think about the open policies overall. And certainly as we think about foundations and other funding institutions, as an example, I met with Jess just, uh, just, just last week in London, or maybe it was the week before. You know, they're doing a lot to promote OER as an example in London. Through their funding policies, they're really calling it into play. So how do we continue to spread the word and knowledge about that? And how do we think about data cycles? So this again goes to the point that it's been a bit of a drumbeat, certainly in the community. As we think about the data cycles, how do we bring in the data so we know what's happening with students? We know where the student learning is, we know how to improve the materials, and we can continue to recycle, improve it over time, and do it in a very rapid way. So in OER infrastructure, how do we think about some of the gaps? And again, these are things that have been discussed. Some of the gaps, again, around knowledge. Again, we have to let policymakers know, understand, has to be debated. When we do have some of the policymakers who understand what we're trying to achieve, then they have incredible influence in the system. And I think we have some exemplars of where that's really happened. We need exemplar policies. Again, talked about this a little bit yesterday. We have to make sure that it happens again at the national, state, and, and federal levels. How do we think about this? This is the lever points. We can do a lot of individual things, but we really need some of the big plays. How do we think about it? How do we make that happen? How do we search by open license? LRMI, how do we think about the tagging? How do we begin to all tag in a way that makes sense? So that pe the content can be found, we continue to use the open license. And how do we track use and reuse? This is in particular has been a challenge for the OER field when I think about the Creative Commons overall. We track, we have an estimate, we think it's a conservative estimate of 500 million items, but really it's not sufficient, and particularly in the education space. We need to be able to track use and reuse much more efficiently. We need to be able to understand how the derivatives are created, what they look like, we decided and backed off in the Creative Commons license and we moved to include the attribution license at all time, the attribution, because people wanted to get you know, acknowledged for their work, their creators, but they also want to know what happens. And so there should be a freedom for folks who create materials or governments or institutions if they want to, and again, I think that's a freedom, if they want to track use and reuse, how do we begin to do that in a systematic way? Because we can begin to tell the story much more effectively than I think we can do right now. And we need connected open repositories. So how do we, as the OER community, connect with each other to make sure the content is much better organized and found? How do we think about solidarity? How do we think about it for this community? Because beyond, this is the core community, how do we think about reaching out to others beyond us? Um, on OER supportive policies, I'm turning it over to Cable Green. He's gonna speak at two o'clock, and I want to make sure I don't duplicate some of the uh, talking points he has there. There'll be many more, obviously, coming out as well. For research, we need compelling economic metrics. I often say that there's been nothing better for the OER movement than the downturn of the economy, and that is not a good thing. But the downturn of the economy makes sure that we can't just play as usual. It's time to innovate. It isn't business as usual when we don't have the resources, and particularly when we don't have the uh, resources in the public coffers. Everyone's now trying to think much more efficiently than they did previously. So this is the opportunity for innovation. This is the window in many ways that we've been preparing for and we should be ready to step in. Seems to have a life of its own. Here's David. David, it's not your happiest picture for some reason. <laughs> Why did you 
you choose that picture? Because <laughs> it was openly licensed under Creative Commons. Uh, so, so David is really great. He's made some great economic arguments about why textbooks and open textbooks make sense for Utah. And he's been able to track the cost of what it costs, less than 1% to make a copy of it, less than one cent to distribute. And so essentially, to, for OER, in particular in this case example of textbooks, to copy and distribute is essentially no cost. And he brings that argument to the legislators in Utah, and they begin to adopt it. So these are very simple um, examples, but they're completely compelling, particularly in these times. And why we need research on student learning, and we need research on the efficacy of openness, and we need research on the efficacy of collaboration in these open communities. At a baseline, we also really need to just be able to explore the social value, the social welfare, and begin to bring that forth. And I think there are many examples that exist. I think we have to think harder about it as a community. And so I point to David as an example with this photo he didn't like so much. Uh, for the OER infrastructure, where are our innovative innovation opportunities? Um, there are many, uh, but let's, I think the yet untapped uh, which we, know, we have always thought about in the OER movement overall is the rapid continuous improvement cycles. Again, this goes back to the data. This goes to some of the work that's already been underway, certainly at Carnegie Mellon. They have some of the st strongest data about the efficacy, but we need more of that data as well. We need more of the stories about openness and how it improves teaching and learning. The early goal was always about creating the precondition to improve teaching and learning. The precondition was the repositories. It's being able to search. It's being able to find it. And then having students, teachers, lifelong learners use the content, be able to track the use, begin to put together OER that's searchable through metadata, the, the open licensing, have students use it, collect the data, find out how that data is being used by the learning registries and other places that like that who are beginning to collect the data, and then actually bring that back to a rapid, rapid cycle. We don't have that now. That's in many ways the missing piece. I think this is the holy grail. Uh, Candace, if she's here, she calls it the killer app. We all might have our name for it. But essentially, that's what we're all trying to get to, because that's the distinctiveness of what open and open educational resources is about. Let me just end with a, a slide of a face of a child. Someone um, encouraged us yesterday to make sure we always, we don't have enough students in this classroom. Uh, the face of uh, students, students everywhere around the world. Uh, students in, certainly in this community here in Boston, it's in the community of the United States, but it's also very much worldwide. And so what we're trying to create in the ecosystem is, go is to reach each of these individuals at all phases of our life. We're not learners from the very beginning. Uh, at only at the beginning, we're certainly learners lifelong. And so we need to be thinking about this and thinking about our community overall. So with that, let me stop and take some questions and input for other infrastructure issues that we should be discussing as well. Since you all have your mics. We have time for about three or four questions. Where's that voice? That was me. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, can you, uh, Mike? What are the accommodations with the existing publishing world and the association, American Association of Publishers. Uh, is there a dialogue that's going on at all? So one of, I think there are multiple dialogues and some of the dialogues are going on with individual OER entities and repositories. The, reposit uh, the discussion that's going on, particularly with Creative Commons, has been particularly around the Learning Resources Metadata Initiative. So that actually is a grant that's been supported by the Gates Foundation. And it was a technical working group that would pull together both the open and more of the proprietary community. So we were the technical lead, but sat around the table, Cable can provide more details around it, but it was very much a joint undertaking. Um, the two communities, as a result of that, have at least come together in a more, I think, uh, task-oriented dialogue. That continues to this day, so Creative Commons will now participate in their big 
um, actually upcoming conference as well. They participate obviously in our activities and so that dialogue is important. I think part of it, the door has always been open. This was from the very beginning. Uh, many of the private entities did come to many of the early OER conferences and certainly have been tracking the work over time. The, uh, were you looking for something more detailed? Okay. Though, if, if I could, uh, sure. Doug Levin, so uh, LRMI is actually a partnership with AEP. Oh, I, yes, if I didn't make, speak clearly on that. Yeah, it's AEP, American asked Education. About AAP. Right. Um, and so, uh, at least in the world that I've inhabited more in the policy front, that the dialogue has been uh, more confrontational yes, uh, I would say than that. collaborative. Right. And so my most recent react, uh, interaction with AAP was at a hearing in California about open textbooks, where both Barbara Chow was there talking about the work of ULIT. Uh, I was talking about the options available through open licensing. And AAP was there. And definitely, <laughs> we were clearly not on the same sides, but we were sitting at the same table. Doug? Well, so uh, on, along that vein, though, because there are um, particularly uh, uh, for, for the aspects of OER, we're talking about changes to the sort of what, what the publishing industry. I mean, there is dialogue that is occurring. I think um, uh, AAP is probably uh, a, a little further to the extreme than, say, a group like SIIA, which is the sort of the mm -hmm. digital publishers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, while that's not necessarily always been a um, uh, sort of uh, arms around the, the shoulder, uh, a collaborative dialogue. It is a dialogue that is evolving uh, over time as their industry is evolving, as we get to know each other better. And I think that there is uh, at least communication there, and I think there will continue to be communication, and I think it's been increasingly uh, productive and mm -hmm. constructive. Um, still have work to do, but everything is still moving uh, and uh, around quite a bit. I mean, and our doors are very much open for figuring out where the, the synergies exist. Obviously, just like all industries, they need to evolve. This is a bit of a threat to them. That isn't why we're doing We're trying to emerge a new model. We think there's multiple models that can exist, but how they coexist is a point of c conflict and, and tension. Jerry? Just to um, look at these type of partnerships, um, we've been working with the e-textbook distributors and Barnes & Noble has put in what we call the OER finder that enables you to find all the OER connected with the textbook or related to subject matter so it's built into their tool Excellent. and so you have to look at what relationships will bring OER value to the businesses. The publishers look at it as a threat, but the e-book distributors look at it. There is a significant value of adding free materials that can augment their book. And so um, there are businesses and we're making money off of that. That's the Merlot project. Very good. Excellent. Thank you for that detail. Yes, Patrick. I noticed in the research you said you're looking for compelling sort of economic mm -hmm. arguments. But actually I've seen you give a, a very good talk <laughs> which has got a lot of compelling creative arguments, sort of the creative spur that's given by free and open. And I, and I wondered whether you were saying we've moved on to economic or whether you're still looking for those sort of creative elements as well. So Patrick's catching me. We were at a CC salon in London about two weeks ago. Um, I think that, well, I had, I had two actually uh, slides, but because of time I was trying to be uh, succinct. So one is there is the stories of the power of open, where we've collected stories of kind of the economic impact and the creative impact of what openness means in many different realms for artists and musicians as well as publishers. And those are the, some, some of the stories that Patrick uh, talks about and that I spoke about just even two weeks ago. Um, but I, in trying to cull this, um, I think it's a combination of stories, but I think if we want to shift policy and we have anecdotes, that's helpful. And it's helpful to have the face of the stories and have the compelling stories, but we do need data. And so I think what I feel compelled is that we do need some of that data, particularly in these tight financial times, because that's a bit of the wedge in. It's not the end and it's not um, instead of, but it's in addition to. And if I had to prioritize at this point in time, then I would say that some of the economic stories are the ones that are going to open the door the furthest. They're going to 
provide the inroads into both governments and into foundations who are investing and trying to obviously uh, maximize benefit. And that's where at least we can begin to see some of the early multiplier effects. So with that, my timekeeper says I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>